All right, here's our period four overview in uh, AP European history. It is basically 1900 to the present. And here's the topics we're going to be going over. You don't need to write any of this stuff down. World War I, there's the years. That's always important to know. The interwar years, roaring 20s here in the United States, age of anxiety in Europe, uh, Great Depression, the rise of the fascist, you know, and, and Stalin, World War II, the Cold War, and then this final European unification and post-Cold War. I think that this lecture does not spend enough time on that, but hopefully um, they will test lightly on that because, you know, of the COVID situation and so many teachers being behind. All right, let's look at the causes of World War I. Okay, uh, militarism, the first Industrial Revolution is like, uh, you know, some people say it starts in this around 1750. Some people, I think, put it, you know, earlier around the late 1600s. But it's like 1750 to 1850. And then the second Industrial Revolution is after 1850. And it's primarily in uh, involving communications and chemicals, more modern things. And you're getting more modern armament like the machine gun. You have the alliance systems. Obviously, the uh, French want revenge for the Franco-Prussian War. You know, this is a European lecture. You have to know about the Franco-Prussian War. Bismarck's uh, plan to unite the German states, the old Holy Roman Empire states under the leader leadership of Prussia. And they crown the new um, Kaiser Wilhelm I in Versailles. And they take Alsace Lorraine. And so the French obviously wanted revenge. And the Germans really just don't want another war. You know, they want to consolidate their gains. If you remember, Bismarck did not even want colonies. You know, during 18, in eight, after 1870, the scramble for Africa happened. And Bismarck said, hey, Germany doesn't need any. Then they changed their mind and jumped in with both feet to get as many colonies as they could. And so the, the, the imperialism, all those colonies, is going to be a major cause of this. But the French ally with the Russians, which seems to be strange bedfellows, the French and the Russians, and the Germans, you know, are surrounded now. So they ally with the Austro-Hungarians and the Italians, and it's a defensive alliance. And so the Austro-Hungarian, the Italians, and the Germans have two names. They're the Triple Alliance or the Central Powers. And then the British, I'm sorry, the French and the Russians are the Entente Cor Corjal or the Entente. Uh, different historians teach it different ways, but at some point Britain is going to join uh, them and that's going to be known as the Triple Entente. So it's the Triple Entente against the Central Powers or Triple Alliance. Some people will call these um, the Entente, the Allies. And these are defensive alliances. And Bismarck really set a lot of this stuff up. And so the whole purpose between them was to keep Europe safe. Uh, and there we go. Uh, the, there we go. We just did that. Let me see. Um, and all this happens after German and Italian unification. Uh, the Italians in 1870 and the Germans 1871. When I teach unification, it acts, you know, it seems like it just happens in a year or two. But this stuff stretched on for a long time. Um, all right, so the here are some of the things that lead to tensions between the European powers. Uh, the Fashoda incident was where uh, the French Navy, as I recall, went up the Nile or down the Nile. Remember the Nile? goes differently than a lot of rivers it flows north i guess that they went up the nile and um, they were basically trying to dominate a certain part of africa and cut the british off and there was a showdown between the um, british and the french and uh, really scared the europeans that there was going to be a major war between them and at some point after this is when the french and the british basically bury the hatchet and not in each other's heads either and they become friends. And the French know that there's an approaching war almost certainly with Germany. And they're going to need the British on their side. Uh, the Moroccan crisis is where Kaiser Wilhelm's navy shows up in uh, French Morocco, which is um, or demands access to French Morocco. And that was clearly French territory. And so they're basically the British, I'm sorry, the Germans are what they call saber rattling. They're trying to scare people. And if you remember the word dreadnought, which this teacher does not put in this lecture, 
but my students should know about the dreadnought was a British ship and there was a naval rivalry going on between the British and the Germans. They're building both their armies and their navies. But uh, the most important part of this competition is with their navies. And so a German dreadnought, you know, goes over there and it sparks this huge crisis. The Germans have to back down. But what starts to happen is the British and the French see the Germans as enemies. Nationalism and domestic unrest. Um, anytime your people are unhappy, a skillful um, demagogue, which is what Hitler was, and Mussolini as well, a skilled demagogue can blame all the problems on somebody else. You know, somebody from another country. You know, the, and, and this is where racism comes in frequently, where if someone looks or sounds differently, it's easy to say, hey, if we just didn't have these people here or nearby or they're a threat, then, you know, things will be going better. So these are all the causes of the war, the Balkan crisis. There's several Balkan wars. Uh, and I don't really get into that. To be honest with you, it's quite complicated. Um, Alex LeMay can explain it, of course. Uh, I'm not interested in explaining it. Um, but there's all this trouble in the Balkans. And eventually, there's um, Bismarck is supposed to have said, eventually there will be a war over some damn fool thing that happens in the Balkans. And he was right. I hope Bismarck said that. Somebody did. Uh, and the problem with the Austro-Hungarian here they're saying diversity, but there are three empires. The Ottomans, who, of course, we're going to call Turkey, the sick man of Europe. The Ottomans, the Russians, and the Austro-Hungarians, they are all multinational empires. And World War I is going to kill all three. The Austro-Hungarian empire is going to collapse, and those two things are going to be, there's going to be multiple con countries that come out of Austria-Hungary. Austria Russia is going to turn to socialism, or the Bolsheviks are going to take over. I don't think the Russian people were all that excited about it. And then the Ottoman Empire, the sick man of Europe is going to become the dead man of Europe and break into Turkey. And so these three countries basically chose war to keep their empires together. And all three are going to fail and be, you know, and basically die because of that. All right. The spark is the assassination of Franz Ferdinand. Very interesting story. The Black Hand sent. I think it was five assassins across the border to kill Franz Ferdinand. And I think it was the first three chickened out. One guy, Gavriel Princip, in disgust, basically went to some restaurant and sat down and ordered probably a beer or something and was crying or whatever. And then, you know, somebody threw a bomb at the car. And so um, they decided to go a different route. And the car pulls right up in front of where this guy is sitting there collapsed in despair because he chickened out. If you're ever going to assassinate somebody, I certainly hope you chicken out. Uh, and so he jumps out, runs out there with a gun and kills both of them. And th this, the lecture is not going to contain this, but if you remember what happens, the Austrians are pissed at Serbia, and they should be. And they call up and talk to Kaiser Wilhelm and say, hey, do we have permission to basically attack Serbia? And uh, Kaiser Wilhelm II, you know, the one, you know, that, has a chip on his shoulder. I'm not going to go into why, but you're supposed to remember. He, uh, rather than thinking this through and realizing, you know, the Serbians are close to the Russians, he foolishly gives them the so-called, if you're writing this down, put this in quotes, the blank check. That means, ah, go ahead, do whatever you want, we'll back you up. And so, obviously, at the Treaty of Versailles, Germany's going to be blamed for this war. If you look at it right here, I guess you, I can see why they did that. All right, uh, I don't know what this is there. That silliness somebody had in here. Western Front. Um, now, I'm just going to tell you, I'm going to go over this stuff quickly. The Schlieffen Plan failed. Remember, it was a plan by the Elder von Mulkey to defeat France in six weeks and then turn and face the Russians. And it failed for a couple of reasons. First off, when the, uh, it went through Belgium and uh, Luxembourg, and the Belgians got all excited and fought back and uh, the Germans reacted angry on the Belgians and that caused England to go ahead and honor its previous commit commitments to Belgium and to come in the war on the side of the Entente and so um, the Germans come up down on Paris from the north but the French had been screaming on the telegraph over to the Russians hey dudes do something you're on our side do something 
And it was supposed to be at least six weeks before the Russians managed to do anything, but they launched two huge attacks. And remember the thing about Russia is they have so many people. You know, it's the Colossus of the North. There's so many people there in that country that, uh, you know, just their sheer manpower, even if they don't have guns, which frequently happens, is a threat. So they come steaming into Eastern uh, Europe over there, somewhere around Prussia, and they have these two huge battles, the Battle of Tannenberg and the Battle of Missouri Lakes. I could have a lot of fun talking about these, but there's huge defeats for the Russians. In one place, they lose a million men, and the Russian general throws down his flag in the middle of the woods, you know, the Russian flag, lays down the middle of it and, you know, kills himself. Something like, you know, a Japanese samurai would do. So it fails. Uh, anyway, it develops into trench warfare on the west. And the trenches go all the way from the North Sea to Switzerland. Uh, and um, there's the most famous book about this is called All Quiet on the Western Front. Because that's what they used to announce every day. They'd say, well, nothing's going on. All quiet on the Western Front. Here's a list of all the uh, weapons. I did all that. I'm not going to go over it with you. Uh, I always tell kids the war that made it so dangerous. The weapon is machine guns. The weapon that is invented that will eventually entrench warfare are tanks. On the Eastern Front, uh, it is really a mobile campaign. It's kind of like maybe the Franco-Prussian War. It's mobile. They're using horses. And there's no big trenches. Um, and the Central Powers do well there, too. The Gallipoli campaign, oh, my gosh, what an embarrassment. Did not get to talk about it this year because we were so behind. Winston Churchill is the first lord of the Admiralty, and he's in charge of the Navy, and he comes up with this idea that if they could just go through Gallipoli, which is this narrow waterway, uh, and, and push Turkey out of the war, then the British can go through, you know, go across the Mediterranean, and take supplies to the Russians, okay? And Churchill's basically got a thing down there for the Mediterranean. Remember, he's going to be the one that wants to come up through Italy and go around to the right or to the east or the, quote, soft underbelly of Europe in World War II. So this is uh, the big, disastrous Gallipoli campaign. The British try to force their way through the waterway. Remember, my master's thesis is on this. And they fail, so they did a land attack. And it basically degenerates into trench warfare down there in Turkey. And the Australians and New Zealanders, the so-called Anzac troops, do a whole lot of, you know, the brunt of the work is on them. And thousands of them die. And I know down in Australia, there's a huge Gallipoli monument. And there's a famous movie called Gallipoli starring Mel Gibson, probably the most famous Australian actor here in the United States. It's a big disaster. Churchill gets fired. The Germans drive deep into Russia. Nicholas goes to the front to uh, supervise it and takes his uh, hemophiliac son with him. And because he's at the front, the Russians blame him. He leaves his German wife back in charge of uh, <clears throat> Moscow, or, I'm sorry, St. Petersburg. And she is subject to the influence of Rasputin. Um, I got that song in my head. And basically in the middle of this, the Russians retreat. Nicholas gets on his train. Remember, trains are very important in World War I. He tries to get back home. His own army stops him and makes him abdicate. And, uh, and that is the first of the Russian revolutions. I'm going to go ahead and go over this. Uh, I think uh, because we need to do communism now. Lenin has been in exile in Switzerland, but he goes to the Germans and gets them to put him on a train. Remember the so-called sealed car like he's, you know, the bubonic plague or COVID or something, being sneaked out of a lab in a test tube. And he comes back into Russia and makes the big speech, the April Theses, peace, land, and bread, all power to the Soviets. Cramming a lot of stuff in this lecture that are not in the, uh, uh, not on the PowerPoint. And the Soviets, remember, are these councils. And so these guys decide, hey, the, the Bolsheviks, we're going to take these councils that exist and we're going to take over. That's going to be our mechanism to take over. And so in the uh, government building, the Duma building, during World War I, after the Tsar abdicates, there's two governments there, the provisional government uh, under the lead of Alexander Kerensky, a, a different type of socialist, uh, an agrarian socialist, 
uh, and in the same building, the Soviet mat, the shadow government. Anyway, there's a whole lot I could do here. I do not have time for it. Lenin takes over in the Second Revolution. Uh, he sends um, Trotsky to negotiate a peace treaty, and that's Brest-Litovsk. They give up one-third of European Russia. In the middle of all this, the Turks commit genocide on the Armenians. The U.S. has never, I guess, officially announced that that was genocide. And it looks like Joe Biden is about to do that. Um, all right, total war. What this means is you harness every part of your economy. Uh, there's a lot of censorship. There's propaganda. And that is a propaganda poster there on the right. Uh, economic production. Women go work in the factories. There's food rationing. And remember, the English and the Germans, neither ones can grow enough food. They're not self-sufficient. So the British put a blockade on the German coastline to starve them, keep uh, them from getting food from their buddies like Argentina and their African colonies. And so the Germans react by building these U-boats or Unterseeboots and sending them out under the blockade to sink the supplies coming into Britain from the uh, British Commonwealth, the Canadians and the Australians and the New Zealanders and the Jamaicans and the Bahamians and the Indians and probably the Americans too even though we're not in the Commonwealth because of this little thing called the American Revolution. Um, anyway, wow, this guy who wrote this, or girl, whoever wrote this, is just jumping right straight for the throat here. The Americans get in the war for two reasons. Number one, uh, they sink the Lusitania, the Germans do. The Americans get pissed about that and complain. Germans promise to restrict their submarines. That is not a um, reason for the war. But in 1917, when the Russians drop out, the uh, British German Admiralty comes to the Kaiser and they say, listen, I know we promised to restrict our submarines, but the Americans are not prepared for this war. If you let us sink whatever we want, we will kick, we'll get England to drop out of the war and the French too. And so they have unrestricted submarine warfare, which greatly angers, angers Woodrow Wilson in the U.S. Uh, and then the second reason is, I always tell the kids, 90% submarine warfare 10% the Zimmerman telegram, where the Germans sent a telegram to Mexico trying to get Mexico to attack the U.S. In the event the Americans join the war, Japan joins. Very interesting, this war, because they want to get some land. All right, political revolutions. Uh, Turkey, you know, they had the young Turks, the young Ottomans. They had uh, Kemal Ataturk. It becomes a secular democracy. Uh, remember their hat? I don't remember talking about it. They have that hat without a bill called the Fez. I was looking this up uh, and, you know, telling my AP World Kids about it. I always heard the reason it didn't have a bill was so that Muslims could wear this hat and touch their head to the ground five times a day. Uh, I'm not actually sure now. That's why they invented it that way. Social changes. A lot of people dead. Women get lots of rights to vote. Societies become more open. And the old saying, necessity is the mother of invention. There's all this new technology. You see over there on the right, you see command economies. Uh, in World War II, we're going to essentially have a command economy here, which is a socialist economy. There's a whole lot of territorial changes over here. By the way, in your notes, you want to underline the word mandates. And the Americans don't sign the Treaty of Versailles because... Uh, Woodrow Wilson thinks, you know, they're overdoing it, and he pushes a bunch of stuff. While he's there, he's a Democrat, like the League of Nations, and the uh, Republicans under the leadership of Henry Cabot Lodge in the U.S. Senate uh, block it. And so, um, he, but he doesn't think Germany should be punished or blamed for the war. And he doesn't think the winners should get that much stuff, and he doesn't think the losers should lose that much stuff. He's a pretty fair guy, especially in my book. Uh, anyway, a lot of territorial changes, but because the Russians are not invited to the war because they dropped out, A, and B, they're not going to pay any of the money they owe because the, the socialists are like, we don't owe any of that crap. This is a war. This is a rich man's war and a poor man's fight. You imperialist, capitalistic people deserve what you got. We did not. And so the British and the French wind up taking all over, over most of these mandates. And this is where... They basically screw up Iraq, and you know, this is where the the Israelis, the Jews, not the Israelis, that was a mistake, 
the Jews ask Balfour, can we have a place to go? All right, the Treaty of Versailles, uh, the League of Nations doomed to fail, German colonies lost, and Alsace-Lorraine goes back to France. What a, you know, that is basically a hot potato. They're throwing it around. Limited the German military in the Navy. And, of course, as we know, Hitler is going to violate that when he comes along. But what he's going to say is, hey, you know, Stalin's saying he's going to take over the world. If he's going to come come get you, he's got to come through me. So you want me to be armed. Uh, the other thing, I saw this on one of your practice test questions. Uh, I guess I'm going to give somebody a big hint, but you're not going to get a grade for that anyway. There was a question in the AP European Test Bank, which said one of the reasons they let Hitler get away with what he did is they agreed with him that the restrictions, you know, this is 20 years later when World War II was starting up, uh, or 15 years later, they, they say, you know, Hitler's right. We were too rough on them. Uh, German reparations, the Germans are forced to pay for the war. There it is, Article 231, the War Guilt Clause. Hitler's going to start every speech he makes referring to that. Uh, you know, saying we were blamed for the war and we are not to blame. And he's going to start off with a little bit of truth like liars do. And if you fall asleep after that and wake up 30 minutes later, he'll be talking about how bad the Jews are. And the mandate system, as, I, as I've already talked about that. All right, Russian Revolution. Oh, man. Causes. Um, i tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to let you skip writing this, but you need to read it. Everyone's upset. The revolutionaries are there. And remember, the Bolsheviks aren't the only ones. Nicholas II, I really hate what happened to him and his family. But we had to read a thing on this in um, when I got my master's degree. He was the reason there was no reform. If he'd reformed, if he'd listened to someone like Vite and reformed, then, um, you know, his family wouldn't have died. Um, I'm not, you know, saying it's his fault they died, but historians would say it is. Uh, they lost the Russo-Japanese War. They were fighting over Korea, and Russia was already the biggest country in the world. Bloody Sunday, remember this is where the priest, Father Gapone, uh, had gone around telling everybody, well, you know, we're starving, and working conditions are bad, but it's because the Tsar doesn't know. And so we're going to take this letter and sign it, and we'll march on his palace and give it to him. And the, Gar the Cossacks wind up killing a whole bunch of people. A lot of people are just stampeded over like a, like some kind of rock concert, you know, the mosh pit or whatever you call it. They're stampeded all over and they die. And the czar wasn't even in the palace. Strikes and riots, economic stresses. Remember, the triggering event is bread riots. So there's a similarity between the French Revolution and the Russian Revolution. He abdicates. There's a provisional government. <clears throat> and you see right there in the third bullet point, they stayed in World War I. The way the historians say it, is they say that the provisional government voted for war credits. In other words, let's pay for the war. There's the Soviets. Soviet does not mean communism. I already talked about the Bolshevik takeover. I already talked about this. After this, we have the Civil War, and the Red Army is led by Leon Trotsky, uh, and he is um, on that train. This is the third train we're going to talk about, and the Reds control the interior of the country, and the Whites control the outside. And Trotsky is riding around on this train, and he's stopping with this and making sending radio signals. He might have had a wireless telegraph. I'm not actually sure if that was invented. There's something about the telegraph. He may be stopping and using the telegraph, but, but he's going around, he's getting directions. And because they're in the interior of the country, they got shortened supply lines. They go through war communism. That's what they call it, where they just go take all the peasant stuff away. And the Bolsheviks are in control of the government. And basically, they seize control and nobody tried to stop them. And it's virtually bloodless. And Lenin was thrown off by that because he said, hey, you know, according to Marx, a lot of people have to die. The age of anxiety, the lost generation. If you read, uh, you, and that's pretty well summed up on the right. Uh, if you read All Quiet on the Western Front, you realize what's wrong with these people who joined the Nazis they're all blown up and messed up, and instead of going off and having fun in college and falling in love, they're beating people's brains out with rifles. I have a World War II rifle. It is a piece of furniture. It's it's heavy, and you just once you pick it up, you realize, oh my gosh, I've never fired it. It's it's a museum piece. 
But you realize, you know, you watch this stuff in the movies. This is brutal hand-to-hand -hand combat. Bayonets. Rejection of rationalism. Remember, the theory was, you know, that we're enlightened, right? We're enlightened and, you know, the world's getting better. And then this massive screw-up happens. Here's some of the philosophers. Uh, rise of the mass media. Film and radio, the cult of the modern celebrity. Radio comes first. I was in a hurry when I did this, but obviously I told you Hitler bought everybody a radio. <clears throat> in the Americas, in, in North America, we have three big broadcasting networks, ABC, CBS, NBC. We still have them. That's our three major free TV channels. And the B stands for broadcasting in all three of them. <clears throat> and we always assume it's for television, but it's for radio. Those were radio networks. All right, causes of the Great Depression. I'm going to let you write these here. The stock market, cause, uh, stock market crash did not cause that. Uh, they overproduced. There's no economic leadership or cooperation. Uh, the effects, it's a, I mean, the crash of the New York Stock Exchange was a symptom of the other problems. Anyway, here's all the effects. Um, okay. Uh, we're going to get to the bottom of the slide here. We did all this. I never find this that interesting to do. Uh, the fascists, the communists, uh, neither one of these people are nice. Uh, the the uh, Italians are the best example of the fascist, and their system is called corporatism. And I, uh, it's really they take these different sectors of the economy and basically say you guys run this together, but all for the good of the state. That is like the most horrible description I've ever given of something. But you see on the right, the authoritarians want to keep the existing social order, and the totalitarians want to use the secret police. The Russians are going to use the Cheka. Uh, the Nazis are going to use the Gestapo. And we are going to stop this lecture here, and I'll do more later. <clears throat>